from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Ron Young is um, in Lanai. He's on vacation, so I get to be your host today. And I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome our speaker today, Jessica Krantz. Um, she has spoken with us before, and it's just a favorite topic. What is more interesting than whales? Um, so I want to tell you just a little bit about Jessica, and then she can finish the job for you. But she's a marine mammal um, bioacoustician with the Cetacean Assessment and Ecology Program at the Alaska Fisheries Science Marine Mammal Laboratory in Seattle. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jessica was telling us that she got her master's degree in San Diego and um, worked with SeaWorld, I think, in some of their marine mammal issues and wrote a thesis on that. And uh, she, I think her first job is still her job, which is with Noah up in Seattle. And I am absolutely thrilled to introduce or reintroduce you to Jessica Krantz. Thanks for coming. Hey, thank you so much for the introduction. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? Yep. Yeah, Fantastic. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak to you guys. Um, as, as Kathy mentioned, I was here back in October uh, talking about one of my favorite whales. So for those of you who were here in October, uh, some of this might be a little bit of repeat. Hopefully there will be some new information. And for the new faces in the room, I, I hope you leave here today with a, a little bit of an appreciation for uh, a whale that you probably haven't heard of before. So I'm going to be talking about the North Pacific right whale. For those who don't know, uh, right whales are a large baleen whale species, so they are filter feeders, and they tend to feed uh, primarily on copepods, which is a little kind of shrimp-like creature you see there. There are three species of right whales. The North Atlantic right whale is probably the one that you're most familiar with uh, along the, the east coast of the U.S. The southern right whale is found uh, across all uh, oceans in the, in the southern south. And then the North Pacific one is the one I'm going to be focusing on for this talk. So the North Pacific right whale is split into two populations. The western North Pacific right whale is found in uh, Russian and Japanese waters off Asia. We think they number in the low hundreds. Uh, we don't really know. We don't have an accurate abundance estimate. But the eastern population is the one that I'm going to be focusing on, and they are the ones that are found on the west coast of North America and are the ones found in U.S. waters. So North Pacific right whales were once abundant and numerous throughout the entire North Pacific until they became the target of commercial whaling. And unfortunately, it's estimated that between 26 and 37,000 animals were taken, most of that occurring within just a couple of decades. And so this brought the population down to probably around the high hundreds, and we thought that they were beginning to recover until the Soviets came in and began illegally hunting in the 1960s. And in about four years, or five years, they took over 700 additional animals and just decimated the population and brought it down to its current numbers today. So what are the current numbers? So NOAA began conducting surveys in the Bering Sea in the early 2000s to try and determine how many of these whales were left. And based on those sighting data, it's estimated that there are only about 30 animals. Of that, only eight females and roughly a three to one male bias ratio, which unfortunately is the opposite ratio you want when you're trying to rebuild a population. And while these data are specific to the Bering Sea, the rarity of sightings outside of that suggests that the overall population is likely fewer than 50 animals. So not many more than there are people in this room right now. So this population very much is facing extinction, potentially within our lifetime. So because of that, NOAA designated two areas as critical habitat, a larger one in the southeastern Bering Sea, that's that red uh, hash polygon, and then a smaller one in the Gulf of Alaska off Kodiak. And so we know that these animals can be found 
in these areas in summer and fall months every year. What we don't know is where they go when or even if they leave the Bering Sea. Migration routes are unknown. Calving grounds are unknown. Some of these basic life history questions about the species, we just don't know. And unfortunately, the last calf was seen in 2004, 20 years ago. That was the last time we've had a calf. And if you look at the old whaling logbooks, even those whaling logbooks from back in the commercial whaling days say that there was no evidence of calving grounds in the North Pacific. And yet, despite that, we have had a few non-adult sightings. We had a subadult seen on, in the Gulf of Alaska in 2005, another subadult off British Columbia in 2013, and most recently a juvenile seen in the Bering Sea in 2017. Now, these animals were all calves at one point. So this begs the question, where, where are the cow-calf pairs? Where were they when they were calves? Is it that they're just so rare we don't see them? Is there perhaps a little hidden cache of right whales somewhere we just don't know where to look? That's my hope. So how do you study the proverbial needle in a haystack? And I do mean a very large haystack. The only place we know for sure that they occur every year, again, is that southeastern Bering Sea. And the video, there it goes. The Bering Sea is uh, finicky at the best of times and downright nasty at the worst of times. This is actual footage from one of our right whale surveys. <laughs> and imagine trying to spot anything in this, let alone a whale. <laughs> These animals are shockingly good at disappearing for being 60 feet long. You know, you're dealing with the survivors of a population wiped out by vessels. So as soon as a boat gets near, they flee, their surface behavior becomes erratic, they stop calling. So it, it, they really don't make it easy for us to try and study these guys. Luckily, they are highly vocal. Right whales will make predominantly three call types. The first one is the one on the top. It's called a gunshot call for fairly obvious reasons. I'll play this for you. It's a fairly long clip, so I'm gonna stop that early. Uh, and that call type, the gunshot, is the predominant call type for this population. They make gunshots more than they do any other sound. They also make what's called an up call. And this is thought to be a contact call between conspecifics or between other right whales. So they use that to communicate with one another. And then they make a variety of kind of tonal sounds, moans, and groans. And so while the, the moans and groans are, are a little ambiguous, we, well, a lot of species will make those sounds, that up call and the gunshot are, are pretty specific. They're pretty stereotyped. Odds are good if you hear those calls, then you have a right whale. So how do we listen for these guys? What kind of acoustic equipment do we use? So you can use a, a wide variety of instruments, everything from a long-term recorder that sits out on the ocean floor for long periods, in, uh, instruments that record in real time that we use when we're actually out at sea. You can put acoustic tags on animals, which on our whales is uh, very difficult, unfortunately. Uh, there are a variety of autonomous platforms like gliders or sail drones. For my talk, I'm going to be focusing on the two that we use most commonly within our lab, which is the long-term bottom-mounted moorings and a short-term instrument called a sauna buoy. So when we're out at sea, we can deploy this instrument, it's called a sauna buoy, you just chuck it overboard, and it will transmit sounds in real time back to a, uh, a receiver on the vessel. And so we can hear sounds as they happen in real time. So if we hear one of those gunshots or one of those up calls, we know we've got a right whale somewhere in the vicinity. The other good thing is that they have directional capabilities. So if we start hearing a right whale, we can deploy multiple instruments and actually triangulate on the calling whale's position. And so I have a video that I'm gonna show you next that kind of illustrates this. 
Uh, but I want to talk you through what you're going to be looking at. So you can see kind of the two rows of the, on the colorful screen, that's a spectrogram. The top channel and the bottom channel are from, from two sauna buoys that are deployed simultaneously. So we have two instruments in the water, those kind of vertical red bars that you see, those are gunshot calls. And then we've got uh, kind of our rough map on the side where the, the little red triangles are, are sauna buoys where we've deployed them. And then the blue lines will be uh, the direction that the calls are coming from. And sorry, it's a little shaky. I was holding my phone with one hand and doing this with the other. So I'm drawing a box around a call on the bottom buoy saying, okay, channel two, up to 800 hertz. And so this plot here shows the bearing that all those sounds are coming from. It's a nice vertical line, just like our gunshot. I enter any correction to the angles that we need. And so you see it just plotted that nice blue line. And so now we can do this for the second channel, or the top row, channel one this time. And sometimes our plots look like this. They're messy, can't tell where anything's coming from. I'm trying to figure it out and I eventually just give up and say, nope, we're gonna try again. So you repeat the process, picking a different call that's a little bit louder, and then it said, hey, you didn't give me enough time. I need more, more time. All right, third time's a charm, right? So draw a box up to 800 hertz, and now we've got our second really nice clean plot with the bearing on the bottom. We choose the other sauna buoy this time. Any corrections that need to happen for the buoy. It plots a second line. Hopefully those lines intersect like they did here. And then on the side, it'll pull up the lat and long of the whale's position, as well as the distance and bearing to it relative to us on the ship. So then we can take that information to the captain. I say, there's a right whale 12 miles at 34 degrees relative to us. Go that way. Hopefully from there, our observers will be able to spot the animal. And then we'll be able to start collecting photo ID photographs, maybe biopsy samples. So this technique has been instrumental in increasing the number of right whale well sightings that we've been able to get over the past several years. Really a fantastic tool. But the real bread and butter of our work that we do is our long-term acoustic moorings. So every year when we're out at sea, we will deploy uh, instruments that look just like you see kind of in that bottom left, and they sit on the ocean floor vertically in the water column Everywhere you see a circle on this map here is where we have one of these instruments deployed. And they will record any sounds in the water to an internal hard drive. We'll go back the next year, retrieve the instrument where we can then download the data and analyze them for, for uh, all marine mammal species or any sounds, um, hopefully hearing some right whales. And so just to give you guys an idea, I like to, to kind of show people a time lapse of, of how we deploy these instruments. Because we get asked a lot, how does that work? You know, the, these instruments, as you saw, are big. The recorders are almost the size of me. Uh, they're held down by an 800-pound anchor. So how we put these together is you can see some of the pieces already out on deck. We'll bring everything out individually, connect them all together. We'll hoist them up with the crane that has a quick release attached to the top. We'll swing the whole thing overboard, and then you can pull the chain on that quick release, and the whole thing will sink down to the bottom. So I'll show you that video here. Oh, just kidding. Got to hit play. So that was our recorder we just brought out, connecting it up to the float. The anchor and the release were already there. Checking everything, making sure it's all cotter pinned so it won't come apart. And so now we're connecting that quick release to the crane hook on the top. With our tag lines, we string it all up vertically, wait for a good moment, bring it overboard, pull the quick release, and then the whole thing will drop in place. And so then when we go to retrieve them, we kind of do the opposite. Um, the moorings have uh, that yellow instrument at the bottom. It's called an acoustic release, and we can communicate with that when we get on site, we can send it a command, we wake it up, it says, yep, I'm still here, I'm this far away, everything's still good, I'm armed. So once we're in a good position, we can send a code to that release, and then that hook at the bottom that you see there, that'll break free from the chain, and the release, the recorder, and the float will all bob up to the surface, 
and the only part that we lose is the anchor in that bottom piece of chain. And then we can bring it alongside, we grapple for a float line at the top, and then from there we can bring it on deck, take it apart, and repeat the process about 24 more times. And just in case you guys think it's a glamorous job, I'm here to uh, disabuse you of that notion. These come up juicy, covered in barnacles, in algae, in critters, and slime, to the point where we legitimately use a fire hose to get the grime off of us. So, you know, I like to keep it real and make sure you guys know exactly how disgusting these things are when they come up. All right, so we just brought all this data up. How do we analyze them? For our data, we have so many species that are all calling all at once that for us, auto detectors have not really been proven to be successful. So we manually analyze all of our data. When you throw in the fact that right wells are rare and we want to make sure we're not missing any calls, it means 100% of our data are scanned and analyzed by us. So we do this in two different frequency bands. We have one for your medium, what we call the medium frequency species, which are your large baleen whales uh, and your walrus. And then we have the high frequency species, which is the bottom right for what we call our high squeakers and clickers, your dolphins, killer whales, belugas, some of your ice seals. And we analyze them for, for everything all at once. Anything that's in that image that you see, uh, for example, on the bottom right, we've got belugas and bearded seals in there. So we can click those two species and move on. We do this for every segment of, of recordings that we have. So it's a fairly time consuming process, but it ensures that we're not missing any calls. So I wanna get into a few of the results for you. So this plot is showing one location for one species over two years. So on your x-axis is time from March of 2015 to March of 2017, so two years worth of data. And then the vertical black bars is right whale calling activity. And so this is the percentage of recording intervals per day with calls. So if that bar reaches 100, that means every recording interval has right whale calls in it for that day. Your blue bars are ice concentration, and then any gray areas that you see is where we have no data. Either it stopped early, we lost it, and so this is, uh, you, can, you can see we have regular right well calling activity every summer and fall at this location, which is one of the southeastern Bering Sea ones in their habitat. And so now we can zoom out and we can look at nine locations over eight years and really get a fantastic view of right well spatio-temporal distribution throughout the entire Bering Sea shelf. And so a few things that you'll note uh, hopefully that's showing up okay. Uh, we have regular, consistent right whale calling in that southeastern Bering Sea near their critical habitat every year. We know they can be found there. That's where they are. But there's quite a bit of variation in the northern Bering Sea. Some years, like in that middle area, we have quite a bit of calling. Some years we have none. This is all dependent on... on uh, oceanographic conditions, right? If it's a warmer year, they tend to be farther north. Uh, if it's a colder year, they tend to be concentrated in southeastern Bering. And I'll get to that uh, a little bit later. So this is how we can really track right whale populations. We can track their movements. Are they moving farther north consistently? Are other species coming to move farther north? So it's a great way for us to be able to monitor populations of not just right whales, but any marine mammal in, in the water. But like everything with our right whales, there are complications. So a colleague sent this clip to us. It was a little quiet, hopefully you heard that. We said, yeah, it's a right whale gunshot. What of it? She said, no, that was from a bowhead off Utkiagvik or Barrow. Yeah, turns out bowheads also make gunshots and they also make up calls. So if you look at this spectrogram, it's about, uh, what is that, I don't know, three minutes or so of beautiful bowhead whale song, right? Down in the, in the southeastern Bering, lots of beautiful bowhead whale calls. And right in the middle are three textbook right whale up calls and a faint bowhead gunshot. So are these right whales that are there over winter with bowheads? 
or are they bowheads that are just making the same calls? We don't know, and that's one of the big problems. So if you go back to that long-term plot, all of these calls that you see that are under ice over winter could potentially be bowhead whales. So for now, these are all just labeled as ambiguous. So again, kind of throws a big wrench in the plans. One way that we're hoping that we can tell them apart is through song. So several years ago, we found out our population of right whale sings not how you would expect. Uh, you know, you tend to think of humpback whale song, right? Really melodious, something that would be found on the background of an Enya CD. Uh, our whales, their songs are comprised almost entirely of gunshot calls. So it's not the different notes that make up the song. It's the number of gunshots and that specific timing between them. And so far, we've found four different song types that have all remained stable for almost a decade. So really, really fascinating that the smallest and most critically endangered population of right whales is the one that sings. Is it a learned behavior from humpback whales that they cohabitate with? Is it something that they've always done and we just found out recently? So many questions. And so I mentioned that we don't really use auto detectors for our data analysis. But we do have an algorithm that we, one of my colleagues, Dan Woodrich, developed called Instinct. And what this will do is it will box anything that it thinks is a right whale call, a gunshot or an up call. And so after we've done our first round of analysis, we'll give the data to, uh, we'll run the data through Instinct, uh, and we say, here's where right whale calls are. Go there and draw a box around anything that you think might be a right whale. And then we go in, we have to manually verify and say, yes, that actually is a right whale, no, that's a humpback. But then when we're done, we get boxes of every single right whale call. And this actually has been really helpful. Uh, it's allowed us to analyze external data sets for right whales. So we have a collaboration with uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada to monitor some of their moorings for right whales. And we've actually been able to find right whale detections on their moorings because they don't have as many species that are calling at the same time. So we've been able to employ this on those data. We've also been able to automate that gunshot call extraction. So it's helped us in our analysis of those songs that we just saw. And it'll help us obtain call counts that eventually we hope to be able to use to get an abundance estimate so that we hopefully will be able to use our acoustic data to try and get uh, a number of animals in the population and we can then retroactively apply that to our entire data set going back to 2007 and hopefully track population abundance over that whole time. Not quite there yet, but that's, that's the end game. And so some other really interesting work that my colleague Dana Wright is doing is looking at right whale baleen plates to do stable isotope analysis. So Baleen whales, they've got these plates that hang down in their mouth, and that's what they use to filter water. They filter their food, uh, the zooplankton from. You can see, hopefully, the little hairs in there that trap the, their uh, copepods and their prey. Well, as the, as the baleen grows, it will have a chemical signature that is unique to kind of your diet, your region. Uh, and it's, it's made out of the same stuff as your, your hair and your teeth. And so you can extract a little bit of DNA from those samples and get a chemical signature for your prey. And so everywhere you see a black dot on that plot down there, that is the chemical, the signature analysis, so to speak, of that baleen whale plate. So you can see there are some oscillations kind of going up and down in that delta N ratio. And so you can compare that value to other regions. So let's say I love pizza. I eat a lot of pizza here. If I then go to Italy and eat a lot of pizza there, the chemical signatures, even though it's still pizza, will be a little bit different because of the different regions, the different ingredients, right? So you can look at those isotopic values and compare them to values from different regions to see kind of where this animal may have gone. And so in the Gulf of Alaska, they've got a higher delta 15N value but then down in kind of the south central north pacific they've got that lower value and so as you see with those oscillations that suggests that this whale was potentially moving back and forth between the gulf of alaska and south central north pacific 
So this could be evidence of a migratory route. And I'm not gonna go into any more detail because it's Dana's work and she's publishing. Um, this is one plate of, I believe, six that she analyzed in total. Really fantastic work coming from her, so stay tuned on that. And the other thing that she's been doing is modeling their zooplankton prey, right? We have so few animals in our population, it's difficult for us to track them and to study them in the entire Bering Sea. But we're hoping that we can use their prey and other species that feed on the same prey to try and determine where these whales may be and where they're going. And what she found is that in years where we've got really cold bottom water, it tends to concentrate their zooplankton prey in the southeastern Bering Sea. But in years where we have really warm temperatures, those prey are moving farther north to stay in those colder waters. And so that ties in our acoustic recorders where some years we had more detections in the northern Bering, those all correlate to years with warmer temperatures. And so this then suggests that as the temperatures continue to increase, that we might see a northward shift in their distribution. Right now, it seems they're a little more broadly distributed, but we could be seeing them shifting north to follow their copepod prey. And then another area of science that we're, we're hopeful about is using satellite imagery. So this has been proven really successful for uh, Atlantic right whales and for southern right whales. Um, most of those populations are coastal. They know where to look because they know where the animals are all year round. Um, for our population, it's still very much in the research and development stage. Uh, satellite coverage is spotty at best up there. And if there are satellite images, it's often of clouds because the weather is terrible. Um, so right now, we can't just start scouring images of the Bering Sea to try and find right whales. But what we're hoping we can do is potentially use satellite imagery to help us confirm reports of right whale sightings. So all of these blue sightings here were reports of right whales that don't have any accompanying photos. So we don't have that photographic evidence to confirm species or number of animals. But now we know where to look and when, so hopefully we can use AI to go in and confirm species, confirm number of animals, um, and then eventually we hope to get to the point where we can use AI to then help us survey large areas of the South Pacific where we just can't get easily with a vessel. So that's a little bit down the road, um, but we would love to, to one day be able to use AI to help in this regard, and maybe that will help us find calving grounds or migration routes or where these animals go when they leave the Bering Sea. And so I want to talk a little bit about the management side of things, right? How do we, how do we take that science and, and turn it into management decisions? So NOAA received a petition from the Center for Biological Diversity and the Save the North Pacific Right Whale Organization to expand the right whale critical habitat. So as the habitat currently stands, it's those two red polygons that you see there. They petitioned NOAA to increase the habitat to include all of those areas in red, to basically connect the two habitats from the Bering Sea to the Gulf of Alaska. And so NOAA found that the petition was warranted and that the critical habitat does warrant revision. So we are going to revise their critical habitat. We don't know yet where or how we will revise it. It may look like this or it may not, but my role in it is we provide the supporting science to the, the decision makers. So all of these dots are where we have those long-term acoustic recorders. So we can analyze those recorders, find out where the whales are, how long they're staying. We combine that with zooplankton data, with the oceanographic data. We find those areas that we think are critical habitat for right whales recovery. And then from there, the, the regional office will make those management decisions. They will ultimately determine where and how we expand the habitat. And I always like to end by saying, I know this is a bleak topic. There's <laughs> fewer than 50 animals, but there's still hope. Um, there's absolutely still hope for these guys. I always like to end on a high note. All the animals that we see are robust, they're healthy, they have very clean skin, they have very few scars and parasites, and we continue to see new animals. We add new animals to our catalog fairly regularly. 
including that juvenile from 2017. And you know, there's a surprising amount of genetic diversity within this population, and animals have recovered from, from similar numbers. So there absolutely is still hope. We just have to give these guys their best chance. And I'd be completely remiss if I didn't actually talk about how to identify them, especially since the right whale was seen off uh, Monterey Bay just last year. So uh, as you've seen from the photos, they are very big, very dark in color, and they have a really wide, flat back. They have no dorsal fin. And they have these white bumps on their head called callosities, and those are unique to each individual right whale. It's like a fingerprint for these guys. They have a very distinctive V-shaped blow. You can see how it stays separate all the way down to the blowhole. Their flukes are really wide. I think they're about the, the width is, is the equivalent of a third of their body length. Um, so very wide flukes, clean edges with a really deep notch. And they have these really unique pectoral fins, that, that really neat kind of paddle shape. So if you're seeing any of these on your whales out there, keep a real close eye out uh, because it, it very much could be a right whale. We're starting to see more sightings off California these days. So if you are lucky enough to see one, um, here's what you do. Obviously, kind of stay away. Don't stress out the animal. Um, but please, please, please let us know. Uh, we would love to hear about it. Even if you're not sure if it's a right whale, we would much rather have 100 false alarms than miss a possible sighting. So you can email us at either of those. That's my cell phone. Text me. Take photos if you can, if you can stay a safe distance away. But please, please let us know. We'd love to see it. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up. The saying is really true, it takes a village, and mine is very large and extraordinary. Too many people to, to name by name here, um, but I've, I have a fantastic team behind me, and, uh, and they, this is every bit as much their work as it is mine. And with that, I will take questions, but leave it on this slide. Thank you all so much. Jessica, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. It was just it's so interesting. You were just talking about um, the funding, you know, and, and the organizations and the people behind you. I noticed the government of Japan is in on it, which is actually very <laughs> hopeful because, you know, I was thinking, of course, we want these creatures to survive, but what if the population does blossom again? Are the Russians going to get out there with their harpoons and the Japanese? You know, so it's interesting and promising to hear that at least there's some level of international cooperation. There absolutely is. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be part of, it's called the Power Survey. Uh, it's an International Whaling Commission sponsored survey. And the government of Japan donates the ship time and the crew time for the survey. Uh, and it's a really fantastic example of international collaborations. Um, as you can imagine, trying to do a marine mammal survey on that scale is extremely expensive, uh, prohibitively so. And so for Japan to donate two months of, of ship time and crew time is, is really phenomenal. And the data that we've been able to, to get from these surveys has been uh, absolutely instrumental in increasing our knowledge. In fact, the, the whale that you see there on that slide, um, that whale we, we saw on the power cruise last summer in September. And we actually just recently named this animal. What's its name? Uki. Uki. U-K-I. Uh, Why? It is, uh, a, I believe it's Inupiat for survivor. So we just had a naming contest through social media. Uh, and people were able to submit name choices uh, with a, a reason as to why they chose that. And then we had a little kind of fat bear week style bracket competition. And Uki was the winner. So I present to you Uki. Well, you know, it, I mean, I understand you, I, you keep track of them by number for the most part, but there is an appeal to people to have an actual name. It seems a little warmer and fuzzy. You maybe connect more with, with that. You absolutely do. You know, people are, are going to care a lot more about Uki or Scotty than they are about Mimmel 110. <laughs> well, yeah. that's right. So, so who banks the information about these whales and you know the numbers and how how do you categorize them and do you share that 
I assume you are the world expert, so you probably are in charge of the database. <laughs> I'm one of one of the experts. Yes. Uh, so we maintain a catalog of known individuals. Uh, every time we see right whales, we try to get photographs of the left and right side of the head. We want to get photos of that callosity pattern of those white bumps. Um, and then we can compare photos to our catalog of known animals, and that lets us know whether it's a recite of an animal or whether it's a new one that we can add to the catalog. Uh, and so we do have, um, I think, 32 confirmed unique animals in our catalog, but we do have quite a few other photos that are uh, too low resolution, the whale's too far away, where we know it's a right whale, but we can't confirm identity. Hmm. So you mentioned that there's um, really good genetic diversity. That's one of my concerns about a species that is be, you know, nearing extinction is you know, what is there to work with? And so how do you know um, that there's genetic diversity? There are only 30 some odd individuals that we're certain are out there. It's a, a great question. Uh, some colleagues recently did a, a study where they analyzed all of the biopsy samples that we have for this population. A biopsy sample, it's just a little piece of skin and blubber that we take from the whale. It's about, you know, this big, so a tiny little Ouch. piece. Um, and from that, we can determine sex, reproductive status, health, toxins, stress. Uh, and so we have, uh, I think it was 32 or 33 samples mm -hmm. in total that have been collected over the years. And so they analyzed the, the genetics in that, uh, and they compared it to uh, Western North Pacific mm -hmm. right whales, and then they also compared it to the genetic diversity of Atlantic right whales. And uh, while the Eastern Pacific right whale, it's not as genetically diverse as the Western population, it is more diverse than the Atlantic right whale, despite being so low. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So could those populations commingle in terms of genetics, you know, in terms of mating? Uh, I think it's certainly possible that they could. They are the same species. Uh, unfortunately, according to the genetics, they are not. They are genetically distinct populations. So mm. even if they are overlapping on feeding grounds, it appears that they're not interbreeding. So is there any way to bank the genes? You, know, you hear about the seed banks and how people have these, you know, we want to save the genes in case calamities happen, we maybe can bring them back. Um, do we do that? We keep the biopsy samples. Um, I don't really know how we'd be able to use them to bring back a population of, of yeah. wild whales. Unfortunately, you know, this, this animal is so large, you can't put them in captivity and start a breeding program like you might for, for smaller species. Um, but we, we do keep all of the genetic samples. Uh, any baleen whale plates that have been collected, we have, we have archives of all of those. And so if you found an abandoned calf, I mean, could you help it grow to an adult? And what, what would become of a, a calf like that? Uh, it depends on how young the calf is. Uh, if the calf is a, a neonate or is, you know, less than one or so years old, uh, the, the odds of it surviving without its mother, unfortunately, are very low. Um, if it is old enough where it's starting to wean from its mother, then there, there's a, a good chance that it could survive. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot we could do for it, yeah. uh, unfortunately. Again, just because of their size, it's, this isn't really an animal that we could keep in captivity. Uh, and it, it would be, I think, too difficult and too stressful for the animal to try and, and make a pen out in the, yeah. in the wild. So I'm curious about like, the behaviors. So are they solitary? Do they, are, they, are they in pods the way we always think of whales being in pods? Because you hear of solitary whales being sighted at times, and do we, of course, don't know if they're solitary. There could be lots more down there. These guys, uh, where we see them up in the Bering Sea, uh, they are generally found kind of either by their ones or twos. Hmm. We have seen occasional group sizes as much as six or seven individuals, uh, but those are less frequent. Up there, they're typically feeding, and so they might be kind of feeding and in the same general vicinity. Um, but we don't see with our population um, large groups that are interacting mm -hmm. at the surface. So for the Atlantic, you can go out and you'll see what's called surface active group behavior, where you'll have 10, 15 whales that are all rolling around on top of each other. Uh, we don't really see that. It'd be easier to spot if they did that. It'd be much easier to spot. <laughs> It'd be really great if we could have 15 all in one yeah. spot. But that, yeah, uh, that, to my knowledge, has never happened. Yeah. So I'm curious also, I was listening to NPR on the way up here, and they, were, they had an hour on, um, someone wrote a book about play, 
and animals and play. And what is play and how do you know they're playing versus other behaviors that you interpret as playing? Do, do whales play? Because people, there are reports of people in boats, you know, where they, there was a boat, you know, where for two hours there was a whale apparently playing and flopping around and slapping the water and putting on a big show. Um, I don't, you know, who knows what the whale was thinking? You, yeah. You're probably the only person that does. <laughs> um, and do they play with each other? And do they play or interact with other cetaceans or other um, kinds of life yeah, in the yeah. sea? Yeah, you, you do see whales playing. You will see uh, species interacting. Uh, we frequently will see a right whale swimming uh, right alongside a humpback whale or a fin whale. Uh, and we, we do see play. Uh, it's, it's certainly not common with our population, um, but we do have a beautiful photo. There was one whale named Smudgy who was uh, photographed playing with a log, just oh. push, pushing the log around. Yeah, a big old log at the surface. So, And then there was a, an animal uh, seen in the Channel Islands back in 2017 that was playing in kelp. It was just rolling around, oh. had kelp wrapped all around its head. And it wasn't stuck. No, <laughs> not in kelp. <laughs> if you have questions, I see some questions um, in the audience. Yeah. And Bill and, and uh, I guess Jennifer is going to bring the mic over. So I have two questions. Yeah. One is when do they develop the, the white, what is it, coloss colossities? Mm -hmm. When do they, at what age do they develop those? Great question. Uh, everything that we know about that is from the Atlantic right whales, so I assume it's similar for our whales. Um, but they they start developing them almost right away, and within a couple months you can see the patterns, and then within, uh, I want to say, four to six months, it's it's nice and clear. So it doesn't change as they age? Nope, it doesn't change. It'll, it'll grow with them. Um, I think if in the first few months it's difficult to, like if you have a photo of a new calf, it's difficult to match mm -hmm. a new calf to an adult. But once those callosities are set and are visible, yeah, they stay the same. And the second question is, you're, as we expand the critical habitat, what does that mean and what does it, how does that impact the fishermen and the other people who make a living? in that area? Another very good question. Right now, the habitat is essentially just a line on a map, right? So all that says is this is the area that we know is important for this species. Um, so expanding it right now, all it does is just kind of expand that line, however we decide. What it does mean is once it's designated as critical habitat, it does make it easier to enact legislation. Right now, uh, you know, there are no plans to, to uh, put any kind of legislation into effect regarding fishing or shipping, um, primarily because we, we have a, a real problem in, in quantifying the impact of those on our population. Uh, of all the animals in our catalog, only two have entanglement scars, but is that because they're not getting entangled? or is it because it's such a remote area that they're getting entangled and dying before it's reported? So we don't know what kind of direct impacts those human activities are having on the population. Uh, and so before we can even get to legislation that deals with fishing or, or shipping industries, we need more science. I think Bill has a question in the back. Yeah, the, um, I'm, I'm curious about the, the white markings on the nose that you're talking about. Colossities? Colossities, yeah. Colossities. Uh, when I saw the picture at first, I thought, oh, those are barnacles. <laughs> um, yep. And I'm curious as to what they're made of, and are they analogous to some sort of skin condition that humans would have that would be a, a permanent marking? Yeah, they are, so they're, they're roughened patches of skin. Uh, so essentially, they're kind of like really thick uh, uh, calluses more or less. The coloring on them, you can see some of them are darker, some of them are lighter. I wish I had kept the photo in here. So the coloring on the callosities comes from, uh, they're called cyamids. So they're, all of those patches are covered in whale lice. It's these itty bitty little crabby looking critters uh, called cyamids. And depending on the species of cyamids, some of them look more white, some look more yellow. So that's why you'll see kind of differences in colors um, because of the different cyamids that they're covered in. And they're, they're just feeding on those, that dead skin patch. So as the, the skin patch continues to grow over the, over the life of the whale, they just keep eating on that skin patch. <laughs> Probably not what you were expecting. <laughs> Interesting. We have another question next to Bill. 
I wondered how you get the baleen uh, samples. Is it only from dead whales, or can you get it from live whales? Yeah, great question. Uh, all of the baleen whale plates that we have are from, they are from dead whales, uh, and they were all from whales that were taken back when whaling was allowed. Yeah. We haven't had a, a stranded right whale uh, from our population, um, I think, since the 60s. So yeah, all the plates are from, from dead animals that were taken previously. And another question is, how long do, you, do the buoys stay under the water? So the long-term buoys will stay out uh, for a full year. So we go out in the, the summer and the fall months. That's when the Bering Sea is free of ice. So we'll go and we'll deploy the instruments and then come back the next year. We'll retrieve all of them, put out new ones. So every year we're retrieving and redeploying. They'll stay out a full year. Yeah. We have a question in the back. Uh, yes. Um, does NOAA work in partnership with any universities, or are there any universities doing research um, of the right whale or any other whales? Yeah, um, there are. There aren't really any other labs focusing specifically on the right whale. There are scientists within other labs and universities that that will study them. Uh, we work uh, really quite closely with uh, University of Washington, uh, with the University of Alaska, um, with the, a lot of their different locations at Fairbanks. Um, and because ship time is so difficult to get, we, ha we collaborate really heavily when, when we do go out to sea. So we'll have um, collaborators and scientists from multiple organizations that, that will all take advantage, that will all contribute. Uh, and then when we're out there, we're deploying moorings, we're doing uh, CTD casts and zooplankton net tows. So we're really doing as much as we can while we're out there to take advantage. Do you share your data with other scientists? So you're seeing all this data coming in on your, on your um, equipment that they're not North Pacific right whales, but there are other kinds of whales. So what do you do with that? Are there people interested? Yeah, we have had requests for data, and, and we're very happy to share. Uh, right now, we just we have it all archived. Uh, it's a everything. treasure trove. It really is, you know, it, and, and that's the, the beauty of, of these data is that they are all archived. They're still saved on hard drives, so we can yeah. go back cool. and reanalyze our data from as far back as 2007 uh, if we learn something new or mm -hmm. look, for, look for something else. If we, if we are able to get abundance estimates, we can go back now almost what, 18 years. It's fabulous. Yeah. Zach has a question. Yeah. So <clears throat> coming from the technology industry, there's an mm -hmm. aspect of the data collection that seems really advanced, but there's also an aspect that seems outdated. And I'm just curious, <laughs> from the perspective of newer technologies, are there specific technologies that you think could be used for the modern? And, and the second part is, is there a reason that the sound collection has to be taken from the bottom and not from something that's floating on the surface that would have more real-time connectivity and, and more you know, constant analysis? Absolutely. So the answer will actually kind of tackle both questions. Um, the reason that we, we put things on the bottom uh, is because for half the year, the Bering Sea is covered in ice. And so if we have any kind of a surface float or surface expression, we have to retrieve it by December at the latest. Otherwise, the ice will come in and take it away. Um, so that's why we, we do everything subsurface is because it ensures that it'll still be there, usually. Um, with regards to technology, that... That also is kind of along the same lines. I would love to have a real-time auto detection buoy, similar to what you see with the Atlantic right whales. They've got a wonderful network of buoys in, in the Atlantic um, that will automatically detect a right whale call and will send that signal to a, a land-based lab who can then alert ships to the presence of a right whale in the area. Mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic alert system to, to let mariners know, slow down, there's a right whale in the area. I would love to have something like that set up for our whales. Uh, and we actually collaborated with Woods Hole back in 2009 to, to set up a, a, a real-time buoy. But because of the logistics of getting out there and setting it up and then having to retrieve it before the ice comes in, uh, it's just not feasible for that area, unfortunately. Paul Kamen has a question. Well, it's, I, I just completed a, a project with uh, New England Aquarium, also funded by NOAA, mm -hmm. uh, to evaluate propeller strikes. And for measurements of propeller strikes, uh, 
Uh, the goal is to figure out what the characteristics of the propeller were and from that what kind of ship was, in, was involved and from there uh, inform uh, regulators with speed and area restrictions uh, for which there's a huge amount of pushback. Yes. Um, but uh, the, the problem there is, is that it turns out it's very difficult to get anything more specific. We were hoping for a a fingerprint from propeller strikes, and it turns out that's ex extremely, extremely elusive. Sure. Um, but not seeing any photos of uh, either dead or living whales that were killed by propeller strikes or killed by entanglement with fishing gear, uh, it, I get the impression this is much less of a problem with the Pacific uh, uh, population than with the Atlantic. Well, that's the tricky part. We don't know if it's less of an issue or if it's just that the area is so remote that any entanglements or ship strikes that happen are not reported, right? If a, if a whale gets entangled in the middle of nowhere and washes up on the thousands of uninhabited coastline of Alaska, we wouldn't know about it. So that that's part of the problem is, is we the overlap between our right whales and fishing and shipping activities is, is extremely high. Um, there's a huge fishing industry in the southeastern Bering Sea, right, in their critical habitat. Uh, the problem is, is, is quantifying those impacts to our population. You know, we, we don't have animals with, with uh, propeller wounds or, or entanglement scars. We have two animals in our catalog with entanglement scars. Mm -hmm. But again, is that because they're not being struck and not being entangled? Or is it because they're being struck and not being reported, or they're getting entangled and not found? Um, you know, one of the main passes in the Aleutian Island chain between the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea is called the Unimac Pass, and it is part of the Great Northern Circle Route, uh, the shipping route for for large cargo ships. So the amount of ship traffic that comes through that pass every day is extremely high, and we do have recorders in that pass that will detect right whales. So there's quite a bit of overlap between right whales and those threats. We just haven't been able to quantify it. Has there been a move to, uh, to sell the idea of uh, sonar-activated buoys uh, to the fishing fleet uh, so they can retrieve their crab pots without having anything on the surface? Uh, the argument on the East Coast is ultimately this saves the fishing industry a lot of money because uh, they need, you know, even though the, the detection and release equipment is expensive, it saves a lot of wear and tear on their other gear. Yeah. Uh, but without the, without the carcasses clearly killed by fishing entanglement, do you have a, do you have a good argument for that? That, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, I, I think ultimately we would love to see our fishing uh, industry in, in Alaska move towards that. Um, but again, we need to have the science to back up any of those kind of management decisions. And right now we just don't have that, that science. We don't have those data. So you mentioned um, when you were getting, earning your PhD in San Diego that you were working with SeaWorld and doing a thesis mm -hmm. on the mammals, the whales in captivity there. Can you talk with us about the ethics of whales, cetaceans in captivity? And once they're in captivity, what do you do? I remember you know, hearing the cry of you know, free the whales. <laughs> there, was, there were movies even. You know. yeah. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so, so for a little bit of backstory, my, uh, it was a master's. Yeah. Uh, it was on killer whale vocal development. And so I studied the killer whales at SeaWorld San Diego. And it was a really unique opportunity for science because we had killer whales that were Icelandic. And we had a killer whale from British Columbia. And then we had calves growing up in this system. And then we had an adult male that had grown up with a bottlenose dolphin. And so he sounded completely different from any of the other whales. And so we got to see how social interactions impacted the vocal development and the individual repertoires of the whales. And it was a fascinating study um, that really could only be possible in, in a captive setting. Uh, so, so to get to your point, my personal philosophy on, on whales in, in an ocean area or in an aquarium is you need to have four components. You need research, conservation, education, and then, and only then, can you have an entertainment aspect. So do I think killer whales or other sentient beings should be in captivity? No. That said, the whales that are in captivity, I think, are 
wonderful ambassadors for fostering a love of, of marine mammals, of killer whales, and, and inspiring generations of people, myself included, to go on and, and, and to become a marine biologist and to do what they can to help save these species. So, you know, as long as the institution has those three crucial things, then they can have that fourth. And I, I think it provides a really great opportunity for for families and for kids who who want to see killer whales but maybe can't see them in the wild. Uh, or if you do see them in the wild, it's often just a, a passing dorsal fin, whereas, you know, this allows them to be on the other side of the glass as the whale's sticking its tongue out at them or splashing them. And I think there's really something to be said for for what that does to inspire future researchers and future conservationists. And it engages the imagination. You even just mm-hmm. see the flip of a dorsal fin, and you, you that's the little bit that you can see, and you, yeah. it just reminds you how much is there that we don't see. Absolutely. And that we may not even know about. Yeah. You know, and the, is, yeah. the questions that I've been asked by little kids when I was when I was working there, you know, I had kids ask me if, if they had a belly button, if, if whales... <laughs> could fart if if just the, the minds of children is 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 a wonderful thing and i think any opportunity that we can use to inspire them and to foster that love is 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 a really wonderful thing what would happen to a captive killer whale that was then released into the wild oh yeah that so that that has been in the in the news a lot lately too you may have heard of lolita the killer whale in florida um, and, and again, I, I want to preface this by saying killer whales should not be in small concrete tanks. I think we're all in agreement there. That said, if you take an animal who has been in a small concrete tank for decades and hand-fed fish in a sterile saltwater environment and try to release them back into the wild, you know, they, they have difficulty learning how to hunt. Who's to say they won't get diseases from, from parasites that are in the water? the stress alone of moving the animal to that environment. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they tried to do it with Keiko, the, the killer whale from the Free Willy movies. They released Keiko back into the wild, and he remained around humans and vessels, and eventually, I believe, got pneumonia. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the, the sentiment behind it is certainly admirable. Um, but... My personal belief, and, and others in my field might disagree, is I don't think it's feasible to take whales that have been in a captive setting for decades and try to release them. I don't think it'll yeah. end well. So I have a couple questions that are kind of flip sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. What keeps you up at night? What gives you nightmares? And on the other side, if you all of a sudden had just an unlimited amount of money to help solve the problem, <laughs> what would you do? How would you spend it? Uh, still talking about, I assume, the, the captive setting. Well, right. not necessarily. Okay. No, I'll I just say, mean well, the, bringing it back a broader focus. Say, if I woke up a millionaire, I'd be uh, uh, having massive marine mammal surveys every year to try and go and find these guys. Um, I, I think f- the, the best thing would be to try and move animals to a more realistic, a more natural enclosure. So finding areas where they can kind of slowly... Uh integrate real seawater into their tanks to try and build up immunity to that, put them into a natural environment where it's not a concrete tank with with terrible acoustics echoing everywhere. Try to get them into a more natural environment. And then you can still have people come and, and see them close up mm-hmm. in a natural environment that, that's much better for their, for their overall uh, mental and, and, and emotional well-being. And if we consider the same um, idea with not the captive whales now, but just in your research trying to help the right, you know, North Pacific right whales, what would an unlimited amount of money look like in terms of trying to help with your research and help the whales themselves? Yeah, an unlimited amount of research. Uh, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is, is being able to go up every year where we know they are, try to deploy uh, satellite tags. So you can, you can deploy a tag that, that kind of sinks into their skin a little bit, um, and it will uh, transmit their location via satellite, right? And so then you can use that to track uh, movements and migrations. They've done that on, for example, gray whales. Varvara, if anyone's heard of Varvara, the gray whale. Um, they tracked Varvara from Baja all the way to Russia and back. That tag stayed in for over a year. Wow. Um, and we were able to tag five different right whales in, uh, in a few years. 
And unfortunately, the tags <laughs> fell out before they ever left the Bering Sea. Oh dear! <laughs> uh, so I would I would love a do over. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would I would love to have the funds to be able to go every year for three four months to stay out there uh, and find as many of these animals as we can, tag them. Uh, I'd love to have observers on every boat that's going out anywhere so that we can we can keep an eye out for them. You know, if there's a boat going out into the middle of nowhere, perfect. Let's put someone on board to look out for whales. Um, Create a know. whole army of citizen scientists. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and we'd love to have the, the, the Atlantic right whales. There's a, a wonderful network of citizen science programs where people can go and, and, and observe right whales from the, from the coast and, and provide some of those information, those data to, to researchers. I would love to have a network like that set up on, the, on our coast. But with one sighting every few years, you know, it, it, yeah. it's not it's not feasible at this stage. If I was a multimillionaire, yeah, I'd, mm-hmm. I'd set up stations of, of observers yeah. all along the coast. Um, yeah, it's it, there are just so many basic life history questions about these guys that we don't know that that I just love the mm-hmm. opportunity to try and find that out. Maybe an outreach to all the people running whale watching tours would be a really good start. Train them yes. and you know, make sure they know what to do if they cite something. Absolutely. And we've actually been uh, increasing our outreach efforts in, the, in, in recent years, reaching out to mm-hmm. whale watch operators, scuba dive operators, sure. uh, recreational fishermen. Um, you know, anyone who, who is out on the water could be eyes for us. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're really trying to expand our outreach efforts mm-hmm. to, to make as many people aware of this species as possible, um, especially if, you know, sightings are increasing along the West Coast. Is it because the whales are coming down here more, or is it because more people know about it and are reporting it? Um, you know, I think it's a little too early for us to know for sure, but uh, I think it's a, a really wonderful opportunity. I love the oper- the, um, the story just a couple years ago we were talking about um, where they sighted a right whale, a North Pacific right whale, in the Monterey Bay, and it was a yes. fellow running a whale watching tour, and he knew his whales. And he said, "This is not what belongs here. I wonder if it's a North Pacific right whale." And he knew to call you. He did in real time. Yeah. So he he reached out to a colleague who then texted me. I got a text. I think ten minutes after <laughs> they saw the whale, as close to real time as as you can get. Uh, and they sent photos, and I was like, "Oh my God, that's a right well. That's a right well." And I was like, "All right, Avengers assemble! Like, what? Who do who do we have in the area that that has a permit to go out and and collect photographs or or biopsy samples?" And unfortunately, like they do, the whale disappeared ten minutes later, and we never saw it again. So. And the whales yeah. are notori- notoriously um, fearful of people in boats, and and we they flee if they see us. They is do. that built into them, or is that something that may have been an evolution? Uh, well, I, you know, the, the, the Soviet whaling happened only 60 years ago. Uh, all the animals that we see, almost all of them are, are adults. And we think these animals can live for a very long time, 80 to 100 years, potentially more. So we could very well be seeing the survivors. Right. Not necessarily their offspring, but the survivors themselves, the ones that, that got away. And if they would have some offspring, we could find out if that trait has been passed on, which yep. would be wonderful. Yep. Absolutely. We hope. Well, yeah. we hope for their sake. For ours, it makes it a little tricky. So you mentioned that the, the prey that these um, whales eat tend to move northward in response to warming sea surface temperatures or ocean temperatures. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, we wonder, is it chicken or the egg? Is it because the prey are going there that the whales are heading more and more north? Um, or is it the whales themselves that prefer the cooler wet waters? Um, but I just wonder if, if the consolidation of the whales could be a good thing or a bad thing, um, in a way, maybe they could find each other to mate, and maybe they would, you know, if you get more of them and concentrated, you could find them and see them and help them. Yeah. And you also want to keep the whalers away. So. Yeah, it, it, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, you, the, they've been protected since the 1970s, so, so, you know, I don't think we have to worry about whalers. Um, and yes, when, anytime you can get a large congregation of whales together, that's, that's a very good thing. Um, the the flip side to that coin is that, you know, the the cooler waters are up in the northern Bering Sea, and that becomes a very narrow choke point to the Bering Strait, where there's a lot of vessel traffic already, Mm. and it's increasing over the years as the ice retreats, as the Northwest Passage opens up, Uh, and so now you're putting whales even more in, in direct 
competition and and overlapping with with vessel traffic so right kind of a double-edged sword and you've got all the all the ice too which they don't like so yeah yeah well um an aspiration please share it with us um yeah this has been so interesting you know it, it, the, these guys are small, but they're resilient. It's a it's a population of survivors. All of our animals are healthy. They're I you know they're they're robust. They're they're nice big awesome adults. So there's there's always hope. We just have to give them their best chance. Thank you for ending on a really positive note because this could be a very depressing conversation. <laughs> Thank and you, you are for just letting me sort of <laughs> buoyant and buoyant and positive, and I appreciate that. And Thank I you. thank you so much for all you're doing to help these animals. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Great. And now I have to d imitate my inner Ron. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ron is more organized. He would have had this all ready to go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Jessica, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so and much. if I didn't get to someone's question, uh, please feel free to come up and talk to me. I, I love talking about these guys, so come find me. presentation of the Wednesday Audit Luncheon.